Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arturo Briedo, and I am a first-year full-time MBA student, and this is Griselda Ramos, a senior at UCLA, majoring in political science. Latin America has experienced a golden period of growth, driven mainly by the strong demand of commodities from the rest of the world, and especially China. However, Latin American economies have slowed more than any other emerging region, and the productivity gap between Latin America and the rest of the world has been widening. To return to faster growth and without running the risk of jeopardizing recent economic and so social gains, Latin America is addressing structural weaknesses, diversifying, di diversifying its economies and closing the productivity gap. Our moderator and panelist will discuss how Latin America diversifies its economies and what role innovation and technology will play in Latin America's future. They will also talk about the role of entrepreneurship in the growth of Latin American businesses and discuss some of the comparative advantages that the region needs to showcase to bring direct foreign investment. Unfortunately, Mr. Keith Kratzberg and Mr. Tom Georges, who are on the schedule, were not able to attend this afternoon's discussion due to illness. We are delighted to welcome the following distinguished speakers. Mr. Adam Green, Anderson alumnus, class of 2010, Director of Development at Solar Reserve, who has been kind enough to step in in place of his colleague, Mr. Tom Georges. Mr. Mark Nealman, CEO of Bamazon Technologies and co-founder of Azul Airlines, Brazil. And Mr. Carlos Sierra, Anderson alumnus, class of 2007, founder of Tunnel and Inalambria International, Colombia. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Carlos, Carlos Valderrama, Senior Vice President of Global Initiatives at the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, one of the organizers of today's conference. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'll tell you, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at UCLA, not only at UCLA, but also working with all the students in developing this program. And certainly today, um, I think we are for a real treat. We have uh, Adam Green, Mark Gilman, and also we have his family here. Welcome. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Carlos Sierra. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you, I just met these individuals uh, a few minutes ago, or maybe last night. But uh, I think they have a lot of energy, a lot of market knowledge, and I'll tell you, you're going to be ready for a big session today. The common denominator today among these executives is that uh, you have a tremendous amount of practical experience of doing business in Latin America, representing not only your own corporations, but also your clients. And so we would like to tap on that experience that you have and convey some sort of message to the audience about why Latin America is very important. So what we're going to be doing is the following. For the next 45 minutes, we're going to try to tap on their experience. And hopefully, you also we're going to participate with your questions. And what we like to do is begin developing some sort of suggestions, recommendations, ideas, and how or why Latin America needs to diversify beyond commodities. So that is the objective. So what I would like to do right now is um, ask Adam, Mark, and Keith a general question in order to begin putting a framework to our conversation. We're going to be talking about very specific things in a few minutes, but I would like again to have uh, this framework of reference that we could have. And so uh, the question is for all of you panelists. The first question is, what are the new industries beyond commodities in which Latin America today, in your experience, has a competitive advantage? Adam? Well, by means of an introduction, I, I would just say that uh, with Solar Reserve, uh, my experience is in project development. We are renewable energy project developers. And so our activities are currently in Mexico and Chile primarily, uh, but we're looking at, at other, uh, other nations um, as well. The, uh, the advantage, the competitive advantage uh, in renewables is, uh, has to do with the local resource. I mean, the fact of the matter is uh, broad areas in Mexico have uh, some of the best uh, solar resources around. Uh, it's an extremely sunny area. And uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile has the best that I've ever seen. Uh, we are configuring solar energy projects in Chile 
that are far more efficient than anything we could do in the United States because of the high altitude, the low moisture, the, uh, the clear atmosphere, uh, and the, the low cloud cover. So when we look at uh, energy technologies, um, it's, it's important to identify which regions and which countries are uh, particularly well advantaged uh, in, in those areas. Um, there is also, you know, there's uh, the, the workforce that's, uh, that's right. already there. You know, right. in, in Chile and in Mexico, you actually have uh, very strong energy sectors and, and mining sectors, you know, these heavy industries, infrastructure projects. So uh, we're actually looking very favorably at, at the local workforce that's there as well. Good. Thank you. Mark? Um, well, uh, my focus today is um, focused on what I believe will be the largest industry coming out of Latin America in the next, uh, in the next decade, shall we say, and then on and much further on to that, and that is bamboo. Um, sounds kind of strange, but uh, coming out of left field here, but that's, it sounded much more crazy, um, let's say, five years ago when I kind of started in on this uh, journey of the bamboo. Um, the, all of Latin America has got a capability of growing bamboo. Um, the Amazon basin today has over 18 million hectare acres of bamboo there that is in desperate need of management to continue the carbon sequestration of the forest. Bamboo is the fastest growing um, organism on planet Earth and it is the most renewable resource that we can do anything with. There's over 50,000 products that bamboo could, could um, substitute a currently petroleum-based product, a cotton-based product, um, and specifically my focus going on is going to be all of our wood products. Um, today the Amazon is uh, deforesting at an alarming rate and we believe that through the advent and usage of bamboo in the region um, that we can create, uh, we can use it as a catalyst to create a, a, what I call the Green Valley which will be um, an area in which that academics and intellectuals and, and people can go and study and, um, and develop new technologies that are going to use green sustainable materials that we can go forward and create a new paradigm in Latin America and when we build up Latin America we're doing so with sustainable materials we aren't trying to apply the same technologies and models that have gone well in the developed world into the developing world we need to actually reanalyze that paradigm that we're doing today using cement, using steel, and using, um, in many cases, illegal logged wood, or even using eucalyptus and pine. Eucalyptus and pine are uh, almost it's extremely bad upon the environment. Um, if you're dealing with, let's say, in, in America, we've got um, different soil than they do there, and in the Amazon, and almost all of Brazil for that matter, you've got a very limited time that you can get away with using eucalyptus and pine. So, Brazil has always been, a, uh, you know, exports of wood products has been one of their, their main things since the first days when the Portuguese went and took all their wood. Um, and so we, we really have to kind of correct those paradigms of the past. And I think bamboo will be the powerful emerging industry, similar to the technological revolution that's happened here in America with all that kind of stuff. So I see as bamboo is kind of being the, uh, the catalyst that could save Latin America. And then I was just talking to him here about bringing more solar, bringing everything else, and, and just focusing on green, sustainable technology, whether that, what that application is. But I think that's the future of Latin America. Thank you, Mark. Carlos? Well, I, I come from a different, different sector, uh, which is technology and especially mobile, the mobile space. Right. Um, I've been, I think, fortunate enough to, to see how this industry, this sector specifically, has uh, completely changed over the last few uh, years. Uh, when I started my first company in 2001, we were in a business that was completely controlled by the mobile operators. So you were really building services and content around uh, a walled garden. Yeah, that was the content that was provided back then. So over the, over the next few years, uh, what we started to see was <coughs> how platform technologies, how smartphones, we're changing completely the whole landscape. So now, what you, what you see in Latin America is this is fantastic phenomenon where you see this huge amount of consumers going from the feature phones or their basic feature phones and jumping directly into a smartphone, skipping a, a generation in between, skipping the PC or the laptop generation. So you see consumers who've never browsed the uh, the web from a desktop browser, who are not used to send emails, 
but they're only focused on using their mobile phones right. and, and their smartphones. So I think uh, if, we, if we talk about competitive advantage, I think we have this huge uh, and, and unique, I think, opportunity to leapfrog many of the technologies that has helped us uh, reach a point where we, this society has, has reached. To, so we can empower more and more consumers using technology. So I think smartphones are one of those uh, uh, tools that will get us there. Thank you. Let's, let's keep with you, Carlos. Uh, now the next question is obviously from the perspective of your industry. Uh, could you see a country or city in Latin America in which they themselves are becoming a global hub for innovation and technology? Well, I, if, if we want to connect, if we want to correlate um, that question to, to the amount of investment that is happening in the region, especially in the technology space or the internet uh, space. Um, I think uh, there is no single place where there is just uh, a lot of activity. I think the uh, Mexico, Brazil first is, is by, by no means uh, the, the biggest market where every, most of the action is happening. But after Brazil, I think Mexico followed by Colombia are becoming uh, more and more used to the idea of building these uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. Uh, so I don't see a single market, I don't see a single country or city. I see a lot of effort from governments, local governments, uh, countries doing a lot to promote uh, the, this new generation of entrepreneurs. Right. Mark, obviously you have a lot of experience in Brazil, but other than Brazil, what are the countries in Latin America you see that they may fit this idea of becoming a global hub for innovation and technology? You know, I think that, um, as he said, I think that there's, it's all over the place. I, too, have noticed that Colombia is a very innovated area. It's a, it's a very forward-thinking place. It's the only country in Latin America with a developed bamboo industry. They're currently exporting about um, $6 billion a year in, in products. So I see Colombia as, let's say, a very forward-thinking place. And I think that um, the size of it helps it, you know. And Brazil's biggest problem is sometimes its size, you know. And it's so hard to get people together. And so I feel like in Brazil, there are many different hubs that are um, turning out to be technological hubs. Campinas, one of the places that we're, um, that Azul, <coughs> my airline, mm -hmm. set up shop, and today is their hub today. And um, for those that may not know, Campinas is where? Campinas is in the interior of Sao Paulo. It's only about an hour drive from Sao Paulo capital. So it's basically between those two markets. That is um, the largest market in Brazil is Sao Paulo. Then the second largest is that interior of Sao Paulo market. And um, that is, I think it's responsible for about 12 million people. Um, Sao Paulo itself is about 23, give or take. And so it, it's an absolutely huge market there. And that has turned into kind of their Silicon Valley kind mm -hmm. of thing. You know, that's where um, I started a technology company there based on automation and home security and door-to-door -door sales. And, uh, and I'd say Campinas would be that place in Brazil specifically. And, and I just wanted to further and agree with him that, that technology is for sure the, the number one thing and just how it would apply to that. But this mobile space he's talking about, it has been amazing to see in Brazil. When I first got there to start Azul, I had the first iPhone and people seeing it, it was as if they were seeing something that nobody ever saw and it was inexistent. And today it's, you know, my maid has an iPhone. Um, everybody, everybody has an iPhone, you know, right. not an iPhone, but a smartphone, you know, if it's a Samsung or whatever. And so, yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Adam, uh, you talk about the activities that you have in, in Chile and Mexico. What are the countries are you looking to, to, to work with? Brazil is also very interesting. Uh, for projects like ours, you know, we build very large power plants, billion dollar power plants out in the middle of nowhere. Um, our, our technology uses a, a big field of mirrors that's about a mile and a half across and a tower that's 650 feet tall. Uh, we've built one in Nevada that, that recently reached uh, you know, full <coughs> operations. These projects are not things that you locate in urban centers. Uh, you really need a great big flat stretch of, right. of desert to right. do this. Right. So the, the, um, the best areas for that appear to be primarily Mexico and Chile. Uh, Brazil is also potentially interesting. The energy market in Brazil is much larger. Um, you know, Chile is an 18 gigawatt market. Mexico is 62 or so, and, and Brazil is 100. Right. So, um, so we're, we're interested in that as well. Good. But really, our, our big projects are going to be in Chile. Uh, <clears throat> when, when we look at these uh, big projects, um, I know most companies cannot do everything. 
So that means that when you go into Mexico, you go to Chile for these mega projects, you're going to need to have good suppliers. Uh, do you bring suppliers from Southern California with you, or do you find suppliers in country? A lot of our supply comes from in country. Uh, typically what we do is we hire an engineering procurement and construction company, uh, you know, a global construction giant, the likes of, uh, you know, uh, Samsung or Bechtel or, you know, one of these big uh, companies that has global operations. They will uh, source the, the local subcontractors to do the, the different scopes of work. Um, many of the components that we use are local. Uh, you know, local in country or local from here? Local in country. So concrete, steel, glass, wire, um, you know, typical construction materials. But then our high-tech components, the, the key technology elements, uh, the intellectual property lives here uh, with us. And, and we will manufacture that either you know, here or in other high-tech manufacturing areas and, and move that to the site. So in many ways, indirectly, you are also helping a small and medium-sized companies from Southern California to participate in international uh, markets like uh, Chile and, and Mexico. Absolutely, we are. I mean, we have, we have consultancies that are, that are based here. Uh, you know, we look at different uh, types of analyses in terms of the topography or the, uh, the native environment there or you know, the, the strength of the sunlight. We have to measure that. There's a lot of engineering and design that goes into that. So we have a, a whole host of, of local and international companies that help us do that. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you briefly talk about your involvement with Azul. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about uh, what Azul is all about and tell us a little bit about how you see Azul playing a greater role in integrating the, uh, the region and perhaps even Southern California. Right. Well, Azul, we started, um, um, our first flight was in, our, in December of 2008. Um, so now we're about eight years in, in existence. We had um, the fastest growth in the history of aviation um, and the largest initial investment, which we needed to get going to Brazil. Um, today we're the third largest in the market. We, um, we have about 120 destinations and about 120 aircraft as well. Um, we, uh, um, we came down, uh, my brother, um, he's, he founded JetBlue. Um, after he left JetBlue, we, we went down there because there was huge opportunities in Brazil because basically there was, there was two players. There was TAM and there was Goal. They had basically divided and conquered the country. Rates were insane. Um, basically, there was about 50% of the country was, was flying at all. Um, and that was a, about an 80% business travel, about a 10% tourism, and 10% um, let's say, um, health travel. So people have to go to a bigger city to get a better doctor or something like that. So um, at Azul, you know, we had a, an amazing growth strategy and amazing business model because um, these, these, again, these carriers, they were trying to uh, take a, an American business model and take it to Brazil without making any adaptations. And the market just wasn't right for a, a 200 passenger aircraft or 180 passenger aircraft. So we went in there. We were the first company to use um, all Brazilian aircraft to start out. We have the Embraer uh, 190, 195. Right. Um, it's an amazing aircraft, two by two passengers, so there's no middle seat. Um, and that's kind of been our, 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 and our, our, our market sh um, strategy has been to have a, um, a, a top product that let's say you know, your wealthiest customers would appreciate, but then we have a, a, f a variable fare as we do with America, but in Brazil, these guys were, were using just two fares. They had the promo fare, which was, which you had to like sometimes book at 2 a.m. on a Wednesday because right. that's just the way they did. They like to punish their clients. And so um, it was really, I, at the time, it seemingly was easy. It was really hard, obviously, growing at that kind of a rate. Um, but it was, it was that's, that's kind of the way I, I noticed that with, with future companies and whatnot. That Brazil, there's so many opportunities but your execution is so important. And we had excellent execution, and so it was almost easy. Um, but now we are having some troubles, and so, um, and it's through you know, no real fault of our own, but as many know, the Brazilian economy is in its um, crisis. Um, I call it its Great Depression. And, um, but I, I foresee an extreme, extravagant, huge spike at the end of this thing. Um, I feel like we're coming into the, uh, Brazil's full potential day, you know. Um, people have always said Brazil is the country of tomorrow and it always will be. 
Um, well, it is tomorrow now, and uh, it's not always going to be tomorrow. It's, it's going to be today soon. So, Good. Well, I, I hope that uh, in, in your future plans, um, you can buy larger aircrafts. Yeah. So you can connect uh, Los Angeles we with actually, Sao Paulo. Yeah, we do have um, international flights, just to give us a little plug here. You can already fly on United from here and fly to Orlando or Fort Lauderdale and fly on Azul. We've got the nicest flight attendant you'll ever meet. We've got <laughs> the greatest service you're ever going to meet with a Brazilian flair to it like you've never seen. So come on down and fly Azul. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, how would you describe the change in Latin America as mobile as startup since you founded uh, is wireless in 2001 and your most recent uh, project tunnel? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and it helps me explain what we're doing now. Um, so back then in 2001, um, we, we started with this idea of um, helping businesses use uh, mobile technology to connect with their customers. And 2001 in a country like Colombia, uh, the landscape was not very clear. Uh, we had around a 20% mobile penetration. I think it was less, 15% mobile penetration. Um, not everyone was still convinced that uh, everyone was going to end up with a mobile phone in their pocket. So we started this journey, and there was nothing around. So it was just this uh, couple of uh, um, students from, from, from university who were really really obsessed about the idea of using SMS, which was a technology that we, we had access to back then, to help businesses connect better with their customers. Um, so back then, there was no ecosystem, if, if you could call it like that. Uh, we were just a couple of uh, guys knocking on doors, trying to raise capital, trying to raise uh, seed money to fund the next uh, 18 months of, of the business. Um, this company in Alambria is now the, um, the, the largest SMS aggregator. Just to give you a, an idea of what an SMS aggregator is, is this type of companies are, that are uh, in between businesses and mobile operators and help those businesses use SMS uh, in, in, in order to solve different problems. For example, banks use SMS to, to uh, send alerts, and this is a very used uh, service in Brazil, for example. Uh, where you just transact, you swipe your card, and you get an SMS alert, and airlines as well. So there's a lot, there are a lot of applications in that in that space. So as as years have passed, where and as smartphones have have now penetrated uh, the consumers, we're now seeing that uh, in in most of the countries in Latin America, smartphone adoption has crossed the 50% mark, mm. which is the a really important uh, phenomenon. I think uh, the idea of uh, using smartphones to engage with uh, others is, is, has been there for the last five or six years. Uh, there's, there's a few categories in, in, of applications and services on your phone that are really, uh, that are really generating dependency on, on consumers. Uh, if I ask all the, all the aud audience, who uses mobile messaging here? Who uses WhatsApp or who uses, I think everyone is going to raise their hands. Uh, mobile messaging has become one of those uh, categories of communication that has completely changed the, the way that we communicate with family, with friends, and so forth. And what, what we started to do in, in, in Tunnel uh, a few years ago was to leverage the power of mobile messaging to enable a better communication between businesses and their customers. And that's what we do right now. So we, we have an operation that has started in Colombia. Uh, this operation is scaling in other countries in the region. We, we, we went after Ecuador. Now we're going after Mexico. And what we're doing is we're very focused on helping uh, consumers and especially businesses in specific industries uh, bring a lot of efficiencies out of this uh, technology adoption. So um, that's pretty much what, what we're Thank doing. You. When, <clears throat> when a company um, looks at a market overseas to develop uh, new customers, uh, a lot of times they do the market analysis uh, and they look at trends, demands, and a lot of times they forget to look at competitors. Are you finding competitors from the Pacific Rim getting into Latin America in your industry that uh, are, should be considered very serious competitors to your business and others? Well. The mobile messaging industry is a very 
crowded industry. I mean, there are a lot of options out there. I mean, there are a lot of messengers that people use on a daily basis. And it turns out that uh, the, the apps themselves are more used in different parts of the world than others. So uh, if you go to China, for example, I'm sure a lot of people here from China, uh, there's one, one single app that rules, which is called WeChat. WeChat is the app that everyone uses in China. And it's the app that it's the segue or the, the entrance to the internet experience for most uh, Chinese consumers. But if you go to Korea, for example, uh, what happens there is that you, you start seeing some local apps that are taking the, the, the attention of everyone. So Korea's uh, app, most famous app is called Kakao Talk. Uh, same, happen in, same happens in Japan, for example. The US, it's a more, uh, it's a more centric uh, market, which is it's, it's more centered around convenience. So most of the activity around in, in the mobile messaging industry it's based on messengers that are making things easier for people. We really think that in, in Latin America, uh, we, we have a different angle that we're going after, which is we're trying to, and we're really working hard on this, we're trying to use mobile messaging as a way to solve people's problems. Uh, so we work with uh, independent professionals. We work with the um, catalog industry, the direct sales industry. We have companies like Avon, uh, companies like Bellcorp, giants of those, in, in those businesses who are really uh, communicating to, to massive audiences. They have uh, hundreds of thousands of users who really want to be connected. And we're trying to give them the tools so they can connect better. Thank you. Uh, Mark, <clears throat> for small and medium-sized companies in, in, in the United States, a lot of times they feel more comfortable of doing business and not only Latin America, but anywhere in the world, with countries that they have free trade agreements with the United States. A free trade agreement obviously becomes a legal document that gives some sort of a, a security blanket mm -hmm. for my investment or for my business ventures. Obviously, we don't have a free trade agreement with Brazil, but you've been successful there. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you do or other business success from the United States do in Brazil, knowing that uh, you don't have that free mm -hmm. trade agreement that perhaps is a security blanket? Yeah. Well. You know, I think um, the, the main reason that there isn't one, you know, is Brazil has always had very protectionist, you know, philosophies regarding Brazil. And so therefore, if they had a free trade agreement, then um, let's say they would be able to, um, you know, import and, and whatnot. So I think it, it, deep down it's Brazil protecting its, its, its turf, you know, and setting up manufacturing. And I think that with the Hayal at, at two to one at, and, and below, I think that that was a huge mistake, you know. Um, but I think right now is the time to set up manufacturing in Brazil. Um, in the last quarter of last year was the first time that Brazil had had a trade um, surplus and they had exported $18 billion more than they had imported that year. And uh, the economist said it was a bad thing because it meant that they were stopping to consume. But I think it was actually a good thing because Brazil is finally learning how to uh, kind of be a little more self-sufficient. I'm seeing a lot more of these uh, manufacturing jobs that they would have been sending them out to China and keeping it in-house. Um, and I think that it's slowly going to move from this. And our, my focus has been, um, has, has been trying to work with local products. You know, with, with my automation company, we, um, we had to work through local products there to not have to import to, uh, you know, with this rate right now. So I think that it's part of what's going to make Brazil go forward in the future is that people are finally learning that you can't just come to Brazil and send a sales guy. He'll close down some deals and start importing and exporting, and boom. Brazil has always been a country that's very hard to deal, but that's the reason why it's protected, and it's got so many amazing opportunities today. Right. So I feel like it's just going to kind of continue to be the case. And, um, if, and they've set up some new things, too, where you can, you can manufacture in Paraguay um, and, and send over to Brazil, no problem. You can manufacture in um, our region where we're setting up, and they're setting up um, specifically sustainable product um, tax incentives there. So I think that as Brazil needs to do some stuff to kind of bring their economy out, that they're going to be slowly creating that thing. And I think that if a trade agreement could be in the future, but only after Brazil has set up enough manufacturing of end game services, right? right. Today, this whole panel is about leaving the commodity um, situation, and that's what Brazil, that's all that 18 billion was all commodity still. So I feel like once we, the technology industry and um, 
focus on making end products in Brazil, I think Brazil will kind of loosen up because they're not going to be afraid. Thank you. Uh, Adam, because of your industry, uh, I'm sure you are very close uh, in a working relationship with, with the governments. Uh, what trends do you see in governments in Latin America right now, especially with the idea of attracting foreign investment, especially in infrastructure development programs that obviously will bring a lot of innovation? Well, there are two, uh, two remarkable examples. Uh, one is in Mexico, where the government recently passed constitutional reform to break up the government-owned monopoly on uh, energy generation and energy supply. So a huge shift, I mean, all the way at a constitutional level of how Mexico uh, encourages competition in the energy sector. And that has been the single most impactful thing in bringing companies like ours to Mexico. It's an invitation for us to, to compete, to offer our, our products, to have a, uh, a path to signing uh, agreements with local entities uh, to sell renewable energy. Um, so, you know, breaking up the, the, the monopoly was a major thing. Other significant policy mechanisms in Mexico have been instituting renewable energy standards or clean energy standards. So requiring, much like California does, that a certain percentage of their electricity be from clean sources. Chile is a little bit different. They actually don't need these incentives because all of their uh, uh, fuels are imported. They don't have any domestic oil or gas or coal. So their energy prices are much higher. And it's purely on economic merits uh, at this point that renewable energy is competing in that market. So instead, what the government is doing is actually reaching out to companies like ours. You know, the, the, the uh, energy ministry actually visited us and, and uh, educated us about a, uh, an opportunity to, to uh, participate in an auction uh, for energy supply. It's actually a, a focus of mine personally over the next few months is, is getting ready for that. So um, you know, having those regulatory policies in place that allow energy companies to participate and compete um, and offer an alternative to the incumbent is, is the most important thing for us. Okay. You know, I think I lost track of time. I don't know how much time we have. Huh? 30 minutes, okay. Um, what I would like to do is maybe uh, before we... Uh, we take some questions from the audience. Um, from each of your perspectives, do you have anything to say, to, to add to this idea that today Latin America needs to go beyond just depending on of, of, of commodities? And what else do they need to do? I don't know, maybe you want to start with anyone, Carlos. Yeah, I, I think one of the, one of the major things that are, that are happening is, is that uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of Latin America it's just flourishing right now. I think each government that you visit, each country that you go and visit, uh, will give you a story about how they promoting entrepreneurship. And it, it turns out that the, the next or the younger educated Latin Americans right now, they no longer want to work for a corporation or a global corporation. Most of them want to make an impact. Uh, and that means working on a small startup or a company where they can see the results of their work. So this is a huge trend around uh, every country that I visit. And uh, I've been lucky, lucky to be involved in, in many uh, entrepreneurial um, activities around the region, from startup Chile to startup Peru, or what's going on in Colombia. Uh, and, and this is a very common thread. I mean, young generations uh, starting companies and trying to contribute on their own way to the economy. Um, from the corporate world, from the corporate standpoint, I think this is just an, 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 a, unique, an, a unique opportunity to, to leverage this new generation of talent. I think uh, these Latin American entrepreneurs are, are, solving, are, are solving the Latin American problems that we have. Uh, so it, it, it might be that some of these startups are going to solve global problems, are going to end up being the, the next big technology companies at some point. But most of the uh, problems that we have could be solved by the, the next generation of entrepreneurs. And I think that that's where the focus of the government has to go. Uh, we we still, need, still need a lot of uh, core capabilities as, as, as markets. We need, we need educated uh, workforce. We need a uh, 
we need to invest a lot in, in those core capabilities uh, as, as countries. And I think uh, at some point, that influx of uh, entrepreneurs, this is going to be the great, uh, a very interesting way to, to absorb talent for big companies. I mean, if you see how the cycle of um, entrepreneurship works, you start, start a company, the company starts growing, the company solves a huge problem and becomes attractive for a big corporation. And corporations are usually uh, very interested in that. I mean, so entrepreneurship could be a way of uh, incorporated, incorporating talent inside the, the companies that, that are not anymore the, the, the big goal of this new generation. Um, you, you mentioned about Startup Chile. Would you tell us a little bit about what this program is all about, Startup Chile? Yeah, uh, so Chile was one of the, the first countries to, to follow this model where it's basically a, a contest for, it's an invitation for global uh, companies who want to do businesses, who, who want to start doing businesses in Chile. So it basically gathers uh, companies from all over the world. Uh, there's a competition process, there's a selection process, and once you have the final winners, these companies get the chance to go and visit the country and establish in the country for the three or four months. Uh, during that period, they, they have a, a huge responsibility with the local ecosystem to transfer knowledge and to, to leverage uh, the, the, the local knowledge. But also, they start uh, helping other local startups uh, do the same. So it's, it's, a, it's been something that's been done for the last few years. I think it's, it's now it's uh, the eighth or seventh or eighth edition. And it's been, it's, it's shown results. It's shown it's creating companies who are doing things on a global basis and it's opening up Latin America to the eyes of the, the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, you talk about uh, this innovation, technology, education, entrepreneurships. Uh, do you see universities in the countries that you participate quite involved in, in supporting this new uh, concept of uh, entrepreneurship and, and motivating individuals to go into startups in other, in other industries? Any one of you? Um, yeah, I see it is. Um, I do a lot of speaking in Brazil and most of them are at universities and um, I think, as he mentioned, I think just now the youth of Latin America are finally seeing that that being an entrepreneur is your way of freedom, you know, of being able to do what you want, where you want to do it, with whom you want to do it, and doing so and having a life again, you know, no longer a cog in a machine of a big factory. And uh, I see that, you know, the universities are helping and um, I think that, you know, that is the big key. Um, one of the other things I think is huge for this movement of getting entrepreneurs going is the immigrant entrepreneurs, right? So. In my city, we've got a whole bunch of Haitian um, refugees that have come down there that, that all of those guys are coming to Brazil and they're seeing the world through a completely different eye set, you know? And anything, any kind of a business that they were to start there in Brazil and get some expertise, they could take it back to Haiti and it could be scalable. And I feel like there's so many Brazilians right now that are leaving the country to, uh, because the, the economy is where it's at. But I feel like eventually once the economy takes off, all of these people who are out in the world getting new experience, new ideas, new things. As they come back, that's going to be a huge explosion of, of things then. Because, you know, as in my case, my first experience in Brazil living was in 1997. And, and, the and from 1999, I was a, a missionary. And the entire time I was there, I couldn't stop having new ideas of a different way that I could, let's say, bring a, new, a concept from America to there. Or I was seeing something in Brazil that had to go there. And, and the entire time I was there, I was kind of seeing it that way. And so, um, I think that that's going to be a big movement, is the, the migrant workforce, people who have left, who are coming back, who are now going to make it a big impact. And I think that it's going to be the same throughout all of Latin America. Um, here at my hotel, I was speaking with a lot of people that work there that are from Guatemala, that are from Bolivia, from Peru, and, and all of them have got a desire, an inner desire. It's almost like, um, you know, with, with um, the movement of the 1980s where people who were um, Jewish, of Jewish descent, they were all going back to spend some time in Israel, you know, and, right. and be right. there and, and go back and help kind of the cause, you know? And I see that, I can see that the Latins that are today in America working and, and getting new, new, new ideas, 
they're going to be ready to make that next evolution in their work progress, right? So a lot of them today are working as hotel, man, hotel, you know, doing valet service and stuff, but they've had a lot of time to talk to a lot of really smart people here and get some ideas and, and rub shoulders with, with bright people, and they can take that back to their homeland, and I feel like that's going to be a big thing. I've joked, my dad is a, um, is a Brazilian um, honorary consulate in Salt Lake, and, mm. and I would joke that any Brazilian worth his salt never wants to leave and stay, right? They're always going to want to come to Brazil, come to America, spend some years here, but at some point they're going to get this itch where they've got to go, go back. back. Right. You know, there's just something in the, in the blood, there's something in the water that, that you just cannot get away from. My father first stepped foot in Brazil in 1954 and has never not gone back. So I feel like there's something very contagious and something about Latin America that once you've been born there, once you've been there, you can leave, it's, you know, but you'll always come back. It's like the Hotel California, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, international trade, whether you uh, are involved in ex export trading or, or imports or investment like you do, it's always two-way. So when you go there, uh, you invest, uh, you do business, uh, you set up a plant, solar energy, whatever that might be. But there are a lot of things that you also learn in country. What are you learning in Chile and in, in Mexico, in your industry, in terms of innovation that perhaps you're going to bring back to California? Mm. What we're applying to our future plans in California is actually the experience of building these projects in Chile, in Mexico. Uh, our next projects are currently slated for South Africa. I know that's a little out of scope for today. But the, the type of entrepreneurship that, that we do in large-scale solar energy is very different from you know, mobile apps, right? It's much slower paced. You know, it's, um, it's kind of heresy to say this at, at a business school like this, but it's really not a place for kind of startup mentality. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it takes us years to plan for one of these, a year to finance it, two years to build it. You know, this is a very slow-moving yeah. slow industry. But what we need is the experience of actually having built it, because that's what's going to bring the cost down. And that's what's going to make our technology and other technologies fully competitive without subsidy against fossil fuels, which have had subsidies for, for years and years. So uh, really, it's, what we're bringing back is the establishment of a supply chain. It's the establishment of experience. It's the, the reduction risk capital that gets applied to our projects and financing. It's the security that investors and construction companies and, and others have that this stuff works, and it works really well. And it's, it's possible at a very large scale. Thank you. Why don't we open for questions? I think you have a microphone here. Uh, please identify yourself and direct your question appropriately. Thank you. I'm Phyllis Chesting. I teach here at UCLA Extension Finance, and I'm a doctoral candidate and a Bruin. My question is um, twofold. I noticed the demographic in these areas, the average age is about 30, and that seems to be an advantage for your innovative um, ideas and companies. But what has been the influence of the larger corporations? I work for Boeing, for example, and United, TWA, large corporation. What has been your, the influence in terms of um, planning the direction of your companies and the success? Well, Either one of you. Both ways. I'm very interested in Azul. I'm very glad to learn about it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it's the biggest struggle of any company is to stay startup forever, you know? Because as mentioned, you know, there's nothing more efficient than, you know, a handful of bright people focused on a problem. You know, there's nothing better than that. And Azul right now, I, uh, I'm sad to say, I think that we are, we, we're in that position where we've kind of got lost in our, in our size. Um, you know, and I think that that's something you can turn around, you know? I think that there's basically, it's, it's, a, it's a phase that it's, your ugly teenage years, right? Everybody kind of goes through an ugly phase, right? And it's during that certain time frame you're going through puberty and you're coming out and you're finding your adult being. You know, you're finding your adult mind, your adult face, everything like that. And I feel like Azul will get to that point very shortly. And I think that, 
you know, that's been kind of uh, what you said. What have we learned from those? It's don't be that, you know? Okay. You don't want to be that inefficient beast of a company that's slow and, and is just waiting for David to come and kill you. Don't be a dinosaur. You know, exactly. There will always be a David to kill a Goliath, you know, and, and you want to stay the David. You know, you don't want to ever be in that position to have the, the target on you and, and whatever. So I think that that's what Azul has learned, you know, my brother with JetBlue. Um, once it got to that size, um, it, things didn't go well, and that was when he left the company. And so, you know, that's the beauty of the past is that it doesn't necessarily dictate the future, but you use it to not make the same mistakes again. And so same that's with what the I think international we're paper company compared to um, your bamboo concept, Amazon. You use any models or lessons learned from that? You know what? Yeah. And again, it's, it, it's to stay limber and to not be, let's say, committed to one thing, you know, with... With bamboo, you know, we want to use bamboo whenever it's the most efficient. You know, there's, a, there's rattan and there's other things that we can use that we want to, let's say, be limber, you know. And bamboo will be our catalyst, but then make sure that we're constantly not afraid to try different and, and all kinds of things. And I feel like bamboo as well, like the paper um, thing, they, they, were, they got too committed. You know, there's, there's the cotton-based papers, there's the, the timber-based papers, and they kind of are, are you know, two, those are two predatory materials, you know. So I feel like bamboo mixing with paper pulp and with wood pulp and all different kinds of things, but to almost be like an alchemist mixing different elements instead of, oh, we like cotton, let's row crop. Let's, you know, I think that's what we learned too, is not to do any kind of a unicrop. We've learned that the environment does not like uniplant. You know, it likes to be in these agroecology situations. And so focus on that diversity in materials, diversity in everything, small, efficient groups. With Bamazon, we want to have, Bamazon is, let's say, as alphabet, say if we were Google, right? And then we have all of our different lines. We're going to have, we want to have an energy generation thing using our biomass of our residuals. So let's say, instead of becoming a big, ugly corporation, we want to stay nimble, stay efficient, and have, you know, these special forces teams and, and set up small factories that are efficient, doing products that are high value add and treating everybody like they're, um, you know, and that's the biggest thing of, of big corporations is the moment they get big, they forget the people. And Amazon and Bamazon's number one priority will be always the people. Number two will be the environment. Number three will be functionality and design. And, and our last priority will be the almighty dollar. Knowing that if you take care of all of your business, the almighty dollar comes. That's <laughs> not what you have to worry about if you do everything right. Next question. Hi there, uh, my name is Nina Camara. I work with small and mid-sized companies that are looking to expand to Latin America, mostly Brazil. I do their sales and marketing. And I have two questions, two very different questions. First, Carlos, my question for you, you talked about uh, smartphones, the fact that you know, half of users in Brazil, Colombia, they're now using smartphones, but a lot of those people are still using them as dumb phones. They're not really accessing data with the lack of, uh, I guess, maybe that's just prohibitively expensive to have data plants. So where do you see that, uh, where do you see smartphone owners actually using them as smartphones? Uh, what are phone companies doing <coughs> in Latin America to, and, and media companies too, uh, to pressure the phone companies to, to offer, I don't know, change the technology, change the pricing plans? And then my other question, uh, Mark, is for you. If you could talk a little, about, a little bit about your enterprise, uh, TIB, this is Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because uh, that, that's a, it's a big um, kind of a um, hole that is in the whole system because uh, consumers are using smartphones, but they're not necessarily buying uh, internet on their, on their plans. So uh, what we're doing is uh, we're working very closely with mobile operators. And uh, as, as I told you before, um, we are a mobile messenger, but a mobile messenger that's being used by companies who want to communicate with their customers. So. What we're doing with operators is we, we're partnering with them. We are really um, launching uh, differentiated options for, for on, on, their, on, their off, on their service offerings uh, so that users can use our messenger without having a data plan, for example. So we pretty much help those consumers uh, get rid of the barrier of not having a plan. And they can still use the mobile phone. They can use our messenger. They can use the data of the operator and they can pretty much uh, achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, so it's, it's a very complicated process in terms of how you scale that, 
but we've seen that in Colombia, uh, out of uh, seven operators, we're working with two of them. And those are really starting to, to show uh, success cases. And, 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 and we, we hope to, to be doing the same on, on, on the next ones. Yeah. So it's about partnering with operators while you get to, to the point where everyone really starts having uh, data instead of even voice. Yep. Um, my, my company, TIB, um, we've actually kind of switched names now. It's Mark J. Nieleman Enterprises. Um, and the focus is this, is as I said, ever since I can remember, you know, life in Brazil, I've been th thinking and figuring out which business, you know, paradigms would fit and, and make a change there. And so basically what that is, is I, I set up the infrastructure to help me help other companies. So this bam, my bamboo project, for example, that was, um, that was a, a, a TV operation. I've got my partners that have helped in doing that. And what, what it is, is we've got a law firm that is associated with this, who's one of the leading law firms in um, institutional relationships in Brazil. So um, when I had to, uh, we started using this law firm with my, with my second company called Vigzool, which does the, the home monitoring and, monitor, um, and automation. And we started using them with that. And just the, the ease at which we were able to set things up, you know, there's um, when you are using telephony uh, equipment there, there's um, Anatel is the, uh, is the agency that has to approve your things. And your process can take anywhere from, from 90 days until uh, three years to get a, a, a unit approved. And these guys were just getting me stuff done within 30 days that usually would take 90 days. And, uh, and they were, you know, super partners. So, and I had already started, I had already started, tried to start and help companies come down to Brazil and we actually went broke before we even got going because the legal work and there's just so many loopholes, there's so many things that if you're with a law firm that isn't, let's say a business partner practically, they can take you to the cleaners, you know, and so they can get you. So TB, what we did is we set up a, um, a, we, a joint venture that it, Bamazon is the joint venture. Our parent company is um, a group out of Hawaii called Bamboo Ecologic Corporation. They've been working 20 years in the market of building bamboo homes, and they had designed these products, had the patents, and needed to find a bamboo supply. So we went and found the bamboo supply. We raised all the money for the Brazilian venture in Brazil through Brazilian investors and whatnot. And then we're going forward with a joint venture with these people. So what we do is we joint venture with, with companies that we believe that we have the capability to install them in a successful and put them in the position to win. And then they bring their expertise, and we are the Brazilian expertise. TB, what stands for This is Brazil, stole it from Leonardo DiCaprio, and, and um, This is Africa, right? And this is, I mean, it's, it's, Brazil is just a different place. So when you see different things, I started to notice I was saying, you know, this is, this is Brazil. You know, you're driving on the freeway, and Ferrari's on this side, and a horse and buggy goes by, you know? And so uh, that's just the way it is, because it's different than anywhere. So someone could have a had be completely versed in, in Argentinian business, but you come to Brazil and you're gonna get your head chopped off. So we wanna just make that an easy transition to come to Brazil from anywhere. Thank you. David? Question, question for Mark. With your family's long experience and your cultural you know, familiarity with Brazil, do you have an opinion of why is the Brazilian government so protectionist? They hold on to the, the, the reins of economic power and they have the example in their own hemisphere of Chile having opened things up mm -hmm. to free, you know, and the and the the good benefits of that. Why why do you think Brazil the the, the, the you know the government holds yeah. up? and do you think they'll ever let go? Yes, I think that they, that's the beauty of this crisis, right? Is that crisis is the only time human beings know how to change, right? We if we're comfortable, we don't change, and so the governing parties of Brazil have always been the wealthy the this, the that, they can jump on a plane, go to Miami and get all the goods and services they need and they don't care, right? And then you got now, you got the PT, you got these guys in there that they cared about the little guys on their way up, they got on top and now they don't care. Um, and really this, this protectionism comes from the fact that every group that went to Brazil in the beginning and for the first 150 years was an exploitive mission. You know, if it was the Portuguese going there and taking all their, their wood, if it was the Dutch coming in and taking the north, it was no matter what. It has always been exploited. And therefore, it just, that makes you protectionist. You know, you get your guard up and get your dukes up. And they, you know, they didn't import anything until the, the early 1990s, the late, late 80s. I mean, <coughs> so it's just, they've done this to save themselves. You know, it's self-preservation through protectionism. You know, and I feel like that those, those, and then it's just that not wanting to change, fear of change. You know, um, everyone who's 
um, liking Donald Trump right now is in that same boot. They don't want to change, you know? And Brazil, they're afraid of change too. And so I feel like this crisis will force that change that we need. And so going forward, we are going to see a different Brazil. And again, I'm grateful for the protectionism because otherwise I'd have, you know, the Chinese would be all in and up in my bamboo. And, <laughs> and I, I love the protectionism. I'm there, you know, and I'm, I'm protecting my bamboo and I'm okay with the fact that that I had to go there and spend 10 years setting up roots before I could get to the fact where I could get in and get, and get a part of these opportunities. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you can join me in thanking our panelists for not only your time, but also your ideas. <laughs>